Wow. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be back in one of the greatest churches in North America under your incredible pastors, Pastor Richard and Nancy. Just phenomenal. And he doesn't get older. Like, he ages chronologically, but he just, like, I started pastoring 17 years. You can be seated. Uh, I pa started pastoring 17 years ago. First, let me just say, I was the world's greatest senior pastor. I knew everything until I became one. And uh, pretty much uh, my IQ looks like the stock market ever since then. It's just every day I just realize how little I actually know. And uh, I've gained weight and I look older. Your pastor looks younger and has lost weight since last time I saw him. So like whatever you're eating, I just, you know, I need some. So <laughs> love this church. I love the fact that we're here in this missions conference, uh, that you are a church about the harvest. It's in your name uh, that you are a mission-minded, go-into-all-the-world church. Uh, I want to also just uh, give a shout-out to my beautiful uh, wife, who gets to be with me, Sunny. Um, show, she, you got to show them your beautiful face behind the mask. There you go. Yeah, beautiful. Yes. Also, I just want to thank my friend, uh, Pastor Lee, for uh, getting me reconnected. And uh, Pastor Lee Wilson has, he's a, he's a founding member on our church board, Element Church, 17 years ago. One of the first people to say, I believe in you and believe that you can uh, start a church and has been uh, just an incredible part of our church team, comes and shares every single year to our church, our leadership team, and you know who your friends are when you hit crisis and you hit storms and who's still standing with you. And I can just say that's Pastor Lee Wilson, who's been that to me for 32 years now. And uh, we used to travel all over the country right here at New Harvest and all over America, and actually places around the world together. So this has been 18 years, so we actually got to be at the same conference together. So, uh, so much, so much great. We're talking about volunteers, and I, I thought this was going to be a workshop, so I'd kind of prepared it a little bit more to be practical, a little bit more teaching. Tonight uh, in our session, it's going to be more let's shout, let's preach, paint the, you know, preach the paint off, uh, inspiration, okay? So this is going to be a little bit more practical. Now, when it comes to volunteers uh, and recruiting volunteers, training volunteers, motivating volunteers, there are a thousand different directions that we could go. But what I want to give you today is I want to give you not as much formulas, but I want to give you factors. Because we go to conferences and you hear a formula. These are five steps, and here's six steps, and here's seven steps, and you go, oh, great. Then you go back and you try to do that in your city, in your context, in your unique culture, under the uniqueness of the vision that God's given your pastor and your church, and you'll find out a lot of that doesn't necessarily fit you. It's like trying to put on Saul's armor. It worked for Saul, but it didn't work for David. So I'm not going to necessarily go, here's the formulas, I'll maybe talk about things that are working for us right now, but know this, by the time I get back to my staff and my church, they will have changed three of the five things I said we do. Why? Because a growing church is always a changing church. And so I wanna focus on factors. Secondly, I wanna focus on the principles more than the programs, because principles transcend time, space, culture and continents and church history. I just love how God laid out the New Testament. And I, it, sometimes it's frustrating for me as a pastor because I would love to be able to open up to the first book of how to do church services. Chapter one, here's your service order. Chapter two, here's the programming. Chapter three, I would how to deal with Jezebels, and, and then Absaloms. And like, I just wish there was just a whole book on just, just church programming, but God didn't do that. Why? Because over the ages of church history, things have to change. When you go to churches around the world, Big C Church, 
Every culture has to do things just a little bit different. Uh, my wife and I were on a Zoom call with a, a, an incredible pastor uh, just Monday night in China who's planted over a thousand churches, and he has to do church entirely different. So, you know, they're asking me questions, and I go, anything I got to say is just not going to necessarily translate to how you have to do church there. And so I just go, hey, I'm the student today. I just want to learn from you. So we're talking about volunteers. To me, volunteers are the lifeblood of the church. How many of you, you are the volunteer? Man, just stand up. We just want to celebrate you, volunteers in the church. You are the lifeblood. You're amazing. Awesome. Yes. Good job. You're voluntold. Stand up. Okay, great. Go ahead. How many pastors do we have in here? Your, your pastors, senior pastors, or pastoral staff? Let's give it up for the pastors. The longer I pastor, the more respect I have for pastors. I used to criticize pastors, criticize churches. I do not throw rocks at pastors and criticize them anymore. Here's what I found. A pastor who has been pastoring for more than five years is about 50% prosthetics because we've been shot, stabbed, blown apart, burned, roasted every Sunday on every social media outlet there is. You know, we're just basically bionic pastors, at, you know, like just because. So I respect you. We celebrate you. But volunteers, you're, you're really the lifeblood of the church. And it's kind of, you're, you're kind of like, God's army, and uh, we're so grateful to live in a country with one of the greatest militaries in all the world, in my opinion, the greatest military in all the world. Any military uh, currently or retired military personnel in here? Uh, raise your hand. All right, well, we all know one. Let's applaud them. For, yeah. Volunteers to me are, are, are like our, our, our military. It reminds me of a story I like about a young soldier who was serving the United States. He was in Iraq, and he was engaged to a, 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 his fiance who was stateside. He'd been over there for quite some time serving our country, and he got a Dear John letter in the mail one day, and he was devastated, and it was heartbroken. And in the letter, it basically said, you know, dear so-and-so, I met another guy. We're going to be getting married. We're breaking off our engagement with you. And by the way, could you send me the picture that I had of us because I'm going to need that for the engagement announcement. He's devastated. Well, all of his buddies around him in his platoon and his barracks got very defensive of his brother, and they came up with an idea. They all took pictures of their girlfriend and put it in a box, and he wrote a note, and he mailed it back to his girlfriend. And, and uh, the note basically said this. Uh, Dear so-and-so, uh, please remove your picture from the box and return the rest to me. For the life of me, I can't remember which one you are. <laughs> That's just funny. You'll get that on the way home. <laughs> Let's talk about how do we get more volunteers. Is there anybody here that you lead volunteers and you go, I could use some more volunteers? Let me see your hands. Six honest people, okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at how do we get more volunteers. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. This is speaking of Jesus. This is how Jesus built a team. He walks up to Peter and John, and he goes, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their, left their nets and followed him. The first way to get a great championship winning team is this. You draft your team, you don't recruit your team. Jesus did not put an ad in the Jerusalem Times advertising for 12 disciples. You know what he did? He handpicked, he recruited. And not only did he just hand hey, if it's okay, maybe you, 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 would you like to help us with, with demon possessed children who have rabies and kids? I didn't think so. It's okay. Sorry for bothering you. Forgive me. Like, who wants to help with that? Jesus didn't recruit. He voluntold. Amen. Quit apologizing for what our mission is. Our mission, according to Ephesians 4.11, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. If you're doing ministry and the church pays you to do ministry, 
you're actually probably doing the wrong job because your job is to equip people to do ministry. So Jesus walked up and said, hey, follow me. Now think about this. Jesus didn't tell him nothing. He didn't tell him salary package, benefits, work hours, workman's comp, retirement, 403B contribution match, nothing. He didn't tell him where we were going. Like Jesus left out a pretty amount of significant details. And Jesus knew the details, by the way. He just conveniently left them out. Like he didn't go up to Peter and go, Peter, follow me. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to call you Satan. You're going to die on a cross upside down. Let's go. He didn't do that. Like, who the heck would sign up for that? But we use that same level of enthusiasm recruiting people. Now, Jesus just walked up and said, hey, hey, sir, follow me. And turned around and walked away. And these guys were probably like, what's up with that? Let's check out and see where this guy is going. I like what Jonathan Edgeworth said. He said, set yourself on fire and people will come to watch you burn. People should just be showing up to your area of ministry because they just heard there's somebody back there crazy and excited about what they do. Look, if you don't love what you do and you don't believe in what you do, nobody else is going to love what you do and believe in what you do. Your ministry is the single most important ministry in all the church. Should be to you. If you think you're number 15 in the kingdom importance, why would anybody sign up for your team? This works, man. Uh, Back in the 180 days, I used this all the time. I still use this as a senior pastor. I just have to be more sophisticated in how I do it, more pastoral. But I walked up to this young kid. We were launching this new ministry, and this young guy was just standing in the youth room. I could tell he was about college age, and he wasn't doing nothing. I just said, hey! What are you doing? He goes, nothing. I go, follow me. And literally just turned around and walked. Didn't tell him what we're doing, where we're going, nothing. So he came into this meeting, and I cast vision for this new program where we're going to follow up with volunteers, and we're going to put yard signs, and we're going to do wiretaps, which are just called phone calls because it sounds illegal, and kids want to do that. And so, like, that's all I did. Well, he signed up, and in a matter of a month, he was leading my entire program, and he volunteered 60 to 80 hours a month. Never paid him a dime. And all I did was say, follow me. I use that method all the time. Look, the greatest people that you're going to get are the ones that you handpick. Jesus handpicked your team. The highest capacity people inside of most any church and most any organization don't have time. They really don't. And so they're rarely the ones who are going to sign up because there was an ad in a bulletin or there was an announcement given in church. They're going to be ones that you have to personally stalk. There is a way to stalk inside the body of Christ and avoid restraining orders. You just need a spirit of discernment in how you go about that. So inside of our church, I'm a recruiter. Every pastor, every person on our staff, it is our job to recruit people. And we volunteer. We draft people. And then we find the draft dodgers and we keep stocking them. And so what we do is we find people and we just simply, certain people, and we, I just, you know, I'll take them out to lunch or I'll take them out to a coffee and go, hey, what are you doing? And I, I fish and I listen for what their passion points are. Everybody's got a passion point button. The key is just finding it and then pushing it. Because if you could fish, notice what Jesus said, we're going to fish. Well, that was their passion. They were fishermen. He hit the passion. He just said, we're just going to flay a soul now. We're just going to change what we're fishing for. He hit the passion button. And so it's your job as you're talking and you're meeting. Every new person you meet inside of your church is a candidate for you to recruit but I'm not in the volunteer ministry department. Oh, yes, you are. Why? Because Jesus said you are. Because we exist to equip people for the work of the ministry. Step one, get them in the ministry. So we're all recruiters, whether it's in your JD or not. And so every new person you meet, 
You just listen. You ask questions, and you, oh, great, where are you from? Oh, oh, wonderful, what do you do? How many kids? Oh, you know, and you listen, and you find that passion point, and then you go, hey, I would love to introduce you to, and you just grab that person, walk them over, and you connect them with the department and go, hey, I was just talking with this person, and they're really interested about getting involved in kids' ministry because, all right, see ya. There you go. You're welcome. I'm going to give you a couple principles in terms of just general recruiting. Number one, it needs to continually be inside of the mission of every church because we exist to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Have any of you that are pastoring ever, you're leading a church, or maybe you're leading a company, have you ever woke up one day after the offering was counted, the accountant gave you your bank balances, and you just said, oh my gosh, we got way too much money. What are we going to do with all this? Has anybody? Pastor? Has, you've never, it's never happened to me either. I, I, I'm just praying for the, the gift of too much. But there's another gift, and it's called the gift of not enough. And I was complaining to God, excuse me, I was praying to God one day about this particular issue. You hear about these checks, you know, the church, your pastor, I, you're, I'm talking to God, God, I hear about these churches that get checks for $10 million, and I church for a million dollars. Lord, just smite me with the gift of too much. And God just said, Eric, I love you so much. Right now, I'm not going to give you that. I'm giving you the gift of not enough. And I go, can I get a different gift? Is there like a return receipt with this gift? Exchange gift? Santa exchange? I mean, come on. And God said, the reason I won't give you too much is this. You will hire people to do the ministry that I've called you to equip the saints to do. And if you have too much money, it forces, it, it, you lose creativity and you lose mission. And there are times I have seen this happen inside of our churches. God blesses our churches. We do grow. And as you start to expand, and what happens is you'll always have a staff member who goes, oh, pastor, we just got all these problems. We got this and that. Oh, God, you're done. We need to hire another person. And every week is basically a sales pitch from a different staff member on why we need to hire somebody else. And there were times I would let it get away from me a little bit, and we would, okay, okay, because I just didn't want to deal with it and didn't want another mad staff member. Not that this church ever has ever dealt with anything like that, because we're unique in St. Louis to upset angry staff members. And so as, as, as I would let that happen, over time what would happen is the organization would grow and we would get lazy because we were now just paying people to do ministry that actually should have been equipping saints to do ministry. And what was happening is we were robbing people of eternal rewards and eternal purposes because we weren't doing our job. We thought we were, but we weren't. So, as a church, what we work to do on a continual basis is we just keep in front of us that our mission is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So it has to be inside of the messages on a constant basis. So here's just a couple things that work for us. Again, it's not a formula. These are just things that work for us, okay? Uh, every year, I will do a series on mission, vision, purpose, who we are as a church. About every 12 to 18 months, I'll do a three, four week series on you know why we are as a church, here's our mission, here's our vision, and I always put this inside of here. Our mission really is just broken into three things. Every church can say it differently. There's no right or wrong because it's really all rooted inside of scripture, but it's to know Christ, show Christ, grow in Christ. So that's the new way we say it. We'll change it in five years again uh, because that's just what we do. We get bored as pastors. So it's to know. We, our job is to help people know Christ. And it's to show. And one of the ways that every believer is called to show Christ is serving. Every believer is a servant. Therefore, it's the church's job to equip them with opportunities to serve. Well done, thou good and faithful pew warmer. Paperweight holder, because the wind was blowing through the chairs in the church. And thank you for holding that chair down and beautiful butt print. 
There's, there's no reward in heaven for a beautiful butt print. So as I'm equipping saints, as our staff are equipping saints for ministry, let me tell you what I never do. I never apologize. I, when I recruit somebody, I go, you're welcome. I'm asking for 12 hours a month, and you're welcome. Let me tell you why. Because when you get to heaven and you realize most everything you spent your life for meant nothing in terms of eternal value and it was burned up, there will be something that will last forever and that's what you did for the kingdom of God. So you will come up to me and say, Pastor, thank you for stalking me and I apologize for the restraining order. Thank you. <laughs> so sprinkle it inside of the messages. You know, one of the things I love to preach about is uh, the body of Christ. You know, when you look at why serving the church, which is called the body of Christ, is so important, think about this. Who were the first people to experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It was several women who came to do what? Take care of the Lord's body. Yeah, but that church is dead. Well, there was three days Jesus' body was dead in the ground. And there were three women who still loved the body of Jesus and they came to serve it. And you know what they experienced? They experienced the resurrection of Jesus. You want stories? You want the power of resurrection in your life? Serve the body. Yeah, but, but my church has problems. Every church has problems because you're in it. I'm leaving this church to go to another one. They got enough problems. Just stay here. When you look at the Levites, what's interesting is they camped around the tabernacle. And the other tribes, you know, we, we know they formed a cross when you looked at it from above the way God laid them out, but the Levites were centered around it. And here's what it tells us. Those that were closest to the Shekinah glory were those that served in God's house and served the temple, the Levites and the priests. You want to experience some more Shekinah? I just want to touch a God. Well, get your blessed assurance serving in God's house. The ones with all the stories of a resurrected Jesus, the one with all the stories of the Shekinah of God's presence are the ones that are serving his body. Mary broke open a, a, va a vase of costly perfume and was wiping Jesus' feet. What is she doing? She's touching the body. She's ministering to the body of Christ. Now, the room was filled with the fragrance of the body. And there are times people come into church and they smell the fragrance of God's presence and the fragrance of worship. But when they leave, the fragrance was left in God's house with God's body. They experienced it, but when Mary left, because she was the one touching and worshiping and serving body, the body of Jesus, the fragrance went home with her to her house. Do you know the people who take the presence of, home, a presence of God home at a whole nother level are the ones that are serving the body. The ones that are making the cost and sacrificially giving of their time and their talent and their treasure. They're the ones who take a fragrance of Jesus' presence home at a whole nother level. And it's interesting that the Bible points out there was a man sitting there who said, why this waste? The Bible identifies him as Judas. There are people who sit around and will watch you. Hey, why are you wasting all your time going up there and serving at the church? Why are you wasting all your time up there with those kids or mentoring these young leaders? Why the waste? That's the spirit of Judas. Never call waste what Jesus calls worship. When you serve him and you're sacrificing for him, Jesus takes it as worship because you're touching his body. What's interesting, when Judas hung himself, because those who think serving God is a waste always get hung up in life, by the way. Jesus called him the son of perdition, and it literally means son of waste. Those who think it's a waste of time to serve the body of Christ will come to the end of their life only to find out they were hung up and found out they wasted their life. Yes. Serving the body of Jesus in any capacity is one of the greatest things that you'll ever do. <laughs> sprinkle it inside of your messages. Sprinkle it in every conversation you have. 
Uh, one way we do this is we, we, we celebrate stories. At Element Church, we love to celebrate stories inside of our giving time at the church where we receive our tithes and offerings. And on a regular basis, what we'll do is we'll tell a story of a volunteer and how God has been using a volunteer in a youth ministry or a kids ministry story, how their life got changed at church, how they got involved. We'll do uh, sometimes a video testimony, just telling their story. Keep the stories of life change inside of volunteers visible. Here's a principle, write this one down. What you keep visible, people keep valuable. Amen. If I had a microphone in my hand, I'd drop it, but it would offend a sound person, so I won't. But just in the spirit, that's a mic drop, okay? So just receive that. What you keep visible, others keep valuable. So if you believe volunteering and giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure is, is, is eternal, then make sure that you keep that visible. I'm going to talk about just a couple practical things in terms of just marketing because you do have to constantly keep this in front of your church, even outside of messages. So just a couple things that you know, we've done. Every, every so often, we'll do a volunteer expo. So whenever I am preaching inside of our Vision Mission series, um, we will at the same time equip all the different ministries uh, to do an expo booth out inside of our lobby. So each campus would do this as well, and they just do it to scale for the, the campus size. And what we do is we do it as a competition within our staff and our volunteer teams for the most creative, compelling expo booth. And we reward them. We do a cool, like, you know, they get a pizza party and they get certain specialty things. And our team just goes nuts at, like, uh, for, for the maintenance team. So our volunteer maintenance team, you know, we got people who help take care of the facilities throughout the week that are volunteers on top of the paid staff keeping the restrooms and everything looking nice on the weekend. Like they had, they went over the top, man. They had like toilets up, like mounted up in their booth. And they had like, it was insane. Like they just basically raided the whole warehouse. It looked like Home Depot. And it was just like, it was cool. Like I go, that, like that would inspire me to get involved. And then, you know, every ministry just went nuts. And it built a camaraderie and a, a healthy sense of team spirit inside of each team because they all worked on that booth together. You give them enough notice, and then they all went crazy, and then crazy, and then you know, and then they send spies trying to figure out what other teams are doing, you know, prayer partners, and you know, and so they were trying to, and it was just fun. So there was a healthy competition inside of that. And so anytime we announce an expo coming up, they just get excited and they just go over the top. You give everybody a little bit of a budget, and it's amazing, you know, what they can do with a hundred bucks, and. Uh, and uh, we think we had a few people arrested for borrowing things without permission, but <laughs> for the glory of God. All right. <laughs> um, if volunteering is a value for your church, if it's part of the vision for your church, then you have to be able to measure it. Here's why. You, here's another principle. Write this down. Another mic drop moment for the sound guy. You can't manage what you can't measure. I'm going to say it again. You can't manage what you can't measure. So if you value volunteers, then you need a way to measure, are you growing inside of your volunteer base? The, there, there's more than one way to measure the health of a church. We can't just measure the health of the church by attendance numbers, especially post-COVID. <laughs> you know, that's been every senior pastor's nightmare is trying to figure out. And who do we still have? And, you know, the, the great, you know. And, um, and I agree with Pastor Dan about you can't just stay home and do church on the, the internet. So thank you for that. I still have half my church on the internet. We actually grew on the internet, but I'm still like, okay, we're open. You can come back now. Thank you. But if you aren't, keep tithing online. and It's great. So they're at least tithing online. So, um, <laughs> so there's more than just the offering number to track whether or not we're winning. So one of the ways, if our mission is to equip saints for the volunteers, then that should be something that we can measure. That's something we should be able to keep in front of our team and our staff. So we actually measure our, our total volunteers. Uh, we have 816 active volunteers. It takes 814 volunteer hours at our campuses to make an Element Church weekend experience happen in all of our different environments. So we have 816. The reality is we don't have enough because workers rotate. So we know that we have a certain need because we m m create a measurement, 
we know the gap, and now we have a goal. If we know we need X amount in hours, we know we have this amount of volunteers, then we can go, we have a percentage of X as a gap. Now we have a tangible goal to go. In the next six months, we need to grow by 5% or 10%. And it motivates. And many of you, you get this because you're business leaders and you're, you're, you're self-motivated. You set goals. You, you set these things. Inside a church, it should be the same way. And so um, you can't manage what you can't measure. Now, what we have shifted a lot of our focus to in terms of our staff culture, and again, this translates differently for every team, every church, every size, but we actually, inside of our performance evaluations for our, our staff, actually have volunteers as a metric by which we're measuring their performance. So we're looking at, did you get a net gain, net loss? We can look at who was it that left your department? We take it a step further. Why did they leave their department? The, now, asking those questions force conversations to happen. Because if you're leading volunteers, one of the, the, the tendencies is just kind of go, well, bless God, they weren't faithful. God will give me another one. You know, and we write people off. Sometimes people don't leave because they're not faithful. Sometimes they were mismanaged. Sometimes they were misled. Sometimes they're in the wrong department and they wouldn't feel like they're winning, they weren't succeeding, and nobody came up to say, how you doing, are you enjoying what you're doing, what's your satisfaction level? Because if you have that conversation, then they go, hey, you know what, man, I don't think my, I, this is the right fit for me. Then you can go, well, let's talk about your passion's points. Let's, let's do some tests, let's do some tests. You know what, actually, I think you'd be better over here. Let's try this. One of the things we haven't done well in Big C Church <clears throat> is giving people permission to change departments. And what happens is when people don't feel, they feel like it's the Hotel California. Like you sign up, you ain't leaving, ever. <laughs> well, you know what, sometimes it's healthy for somebody to serve in an area for two years and then to go, you know what, we're gonna take that and we're gonna, we're gonna let you go over here for another season. That department's gonna benefit from it. You're freeing up a new seat. But for these things to happen, here's what has to happen, conversations. For years, what I would have is I had staff who thought their job was doing ministry rather than working on the ministry, which is leading their people. And so they were doing a bunch of things, and they were just ignoring their volunteers. They weren't investing into their volunteers, taking their volunteers out to a coffee, pastoring their volunteer teams. Hey, the first people you should be pastoring is your volunteers. Pouring into them, taking them out. How you doing? How's your kids? How can we be praying for you? and listening to them, and investing into them. Because one of the mistakes we make, and I'm just rambling now, one of the mistakes that we make as churches is we ask for a hand before we touch a heart. Write that down, that's another great mic drop principle. I would go through all your microphones this morning, so we're just gonna, in the spirit, feel it. Touch a heart before you ask for a hand. So inside of what we measure on our staff is this. It's an actual measurement, Inside of their evaluations and inside of their performance is this. How many touches did you have with your volunteers? We give them a budget. Because we value it, we give finances to it. So we give you a budget, $12. Just kidding. So we give you a budget. Now, here's what I've had to do is, is we'd give them a budget, and they'd take one person out to a really nice steak. And I go, that's dumb. Don't do that because you could take 50 people out for that really nice steak. So just coffees. Everybody say coffees. You can touch a lot of people with coffees. And so I, I just teach my team, this is what you do. You just take your Thursday afternoon or whatever day it is, and you just stack 30-minute meetings at Starbucks, glory to God, back-to-back -back with your volunteers. And the benefit of stacking them back-to-back -back is when the next volunteer comes in, that person realizes that they're your next appointment's there, and that person who talks forever, and that's why you've avoided them, <laughs> they have to leave now because the next appointment's there. Can you say genius? You're welcome. That's how you get out of those. You just stack them. You take your most talkative person and you put them first, not at the end of the day when you're trying to get home. Put them first. <laughs> All right, that's, that's free stuff right there. Um... I had a lot of things, so I'm just going to boil this down to. Um, 
Something that helps retain volunteers is how are you initially onboarding them? Too often what we do, and hey, I've been guilty of this, our church has been guilty of this, and you know what, we'll still be guilty of this. It's just the nature of sometimes church, churches as you continue to grow, and uh, is there are times that we under-equip people as they're coming in. And so set people up for success on the front end and you'll find a lot less burnout on the back end. So before, often what would happen, somebody would sign up and we go, awesome, let's check your qualifications. Woo, you got a pulse? Fantastic, you are qualified. And then we would throw them in, lock the door, and we, you know, just a Hail Mary, good, God bless you, hope you make it. And then six months later, they'd come crawling out and we'd just throw in another fresh body. But the problem was we didn't equip them and set them up for success. Something we've shifted to inside of our orientation process for new volunteers is a one-month onboarding process where we're not asking them to volunteer, we're asking them to shadow a mentor. So they will spend a month shadowing a mentor inside of kids' ministry or youth ministry or greeters or wherever it's at, and they're shadowing, they're learning, they're getting coached, then it's kind of the John Maxwell, you know, I'm gonna do it, you watch, you know, we're gonna do it together, then you're gonna do it, I'm gonna watch, and then now you're solo. And inside of that process, it helps people build their confidence. And so the second thing that you wanna do is you wanna add a follow-up meeting, a 30 to 60, 90 days inside of that period of time where you touch base with that volunteer for a checkup. Hey, how's this going? Does this feel good? Often, it's gonna be in that 90-day window that person's gonna already make a decision, how do I get out of this thing? And depending on their creativity level determines how long they can last. But a lot of people, you just, have you found people just get out of church and they drift church, and you're like, where did they go? I have found this from conversations over time. Many people actually just left the church because they were stuck volunteering in a ministry and they didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings by saying, I want to quit <laughs> and I want to go to do something different. So they find it easier to disappear and leave the church than to have a confrontational conversation and hurt your feelings by saying, I'm not happy doing this job. It's not that they didn't love Jesus. It's just they just didn't like this job because they might not have been in the right fit. Our statement at Element Church is, are you in your element? If you're not in your element, let's find your element. We give people permission to try different things on until we find the right size, because not the right size, it's not a one size fits all. But you need somebody to follow up just to go, hey, and it, usually the person who mentored them is the best person to be able to follow up with them. Just, hey, how you doing? How's it going? Here's another person you wanna add into the mix, and that is somebody outside of that department to do a follow-up with that volunteer to ask what they really think about that department. Because if the youth pastor, case in point, youth pastor goes up to a new volunteer who's been there six months. Hey man, what do you think? Now, this, this hypothetical scenario, this does not happen in churches, just hypothetical. This volunteer has been miscommunicated with consistently. Uh, there's no details about what they're supposed to do. They get information last minute. They get asked to do a bunch of last minute things that were because somebody else dropped the ball because they hadn't properly planned. So their crisis is now their crisis. They don't get feedback. Hey, how are you doing? They're not told you're doing a good job. They're not being coached. They're not being equipped. They're not having any value added, right? And then the youth pastor comes up and goes, hey man, what do you think, isn't this great? You love working here with love, yeah, woo! And here's what 99% of those conversations are. Oh, I just love the youth ministry. This is wonderful. You're the greatest youth pastor in all of America. I'm not even sure Pastor Foley appreciates how amazing you actually are. <laughs> they weren't honest. Here's what I know, most people aren't honest. Not because they're dishonest, but because they're afraid to hurt people's feelings. So if you add an outside person who's kind of your HR on your team to have a sideways conversation, and, and all my team knows this, people will talk to your people who are not part of your people so we can actually know what they think. And that too will go in your performance evaluation. <laughs> so, all right. 
So that person is able to really get the real feedback so that we can coach and help our teams get better. Okay, great. All right, that's good. Um, how do you reward and motivate your volunteers? One of the greatest things that you can do to keep your, motiv your volunteers inspired and motivated is number one, celebrate them. We do team huddles uh, with our departments before, uh, you know, kids ministry will huddle, ushers will huddle. And something you can do inside of those, the greatest currency you can give people is respect and appreciation. Because we live in a culture where we're just a vacuum of respect and appreciation. So take a time to celebrate a volunteer and highlight something great that they did. Hey, man, I want to talk about Fred. Last week he went way over the top, did this, Susie did this, and celebrate that. Share stories is another thing. So, hey, Fred, he had a story about a kid that got their life changed in the youth. Share that story real quick, Fred. And so when they're sharing stories and you're celebrating your teams publicly in those huddles, it just lifts their spirit. Because there comes a point, money isn't enough to keep somebody motivated. But the currency of I'm making a difference and I'm adding value, that is what keeps people inspired to keep on going. Something we've added into uh, just... We've done over the years, and we kind of do it in different cycles, but that is a volunteer, an annual volunteer appreciation event where we pull all of our volunteers together, and it's different all the time. We do red carpet events sometimes where we'll roll out red carpet, and you kind of make it like an Academy Awards. Uh, there's times, you know, we'll do uh, trophies. We'll give out awards. Uh, their favorite, though, is when I host bingo, and I give out several thousand dollars in prizes with bingo. Because my church is all Catholic because it's St. Louis. So 85% of our church came from St. Louis. So like, oh, it's good to see Pastor Full of the Holy Ghost leading bingo. Like that, that's a spirit-filled pastor in St. Louis when you can lead a bingo service. And, uh, but they love it. And so, you know, we just have fun. And my staff's up there and, and we're doing a bingo thing. But again, context, culture, it's all different. But just different ways you can publicly validate and appreciate your volunteers. That just keeps them inspired. Okay. 